Okie dokie, everybody. Here we go. Okay, it's the the twelfth installment of Liam Small abridges a history of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse. Twenty pages at a time until the fucking bars reopen. Oh, this is getting repetitive. Um, today we're going through pages um, two hundred, no, nope, two hundred and twenty to two hundred and forty. Um, I <laughs> can't think of anything I want to be doing less right now than this, so I'm going to dive into it. I hope you guys are staying safe. Keep flattening the curb, all that good shit. Um, cool. So yesterday when we left off, um, we left way off with this guy, Badoin, Badoin, uh, he was a French, basically he was a spy, he shit all over the Newfoundlanders, and, uh, you know, he was... He made all these journals calling Newfoundlanders down to the dirt and stuff. I, I made some quotes about that. They were disparaging. Didn't really like him. Um, also, in, in his reports, it's just of a note that he didn't really accurately report, like, how everything... If, if this is one of the only uh, pictures of what the time like that was of his reports, um, you know, he was only reporting, really, the French gains and stuff, so it didn't... It made the English look a lot worse than they were. It made the Newfoundlanders look a lot worse than they were because we're only getting... His side of the story, he wasn't noting how much they obviously would have lost as well. Um, it was also noted, we were talking about the, the Petty Harbor thing. It was just noted that the planters, they, they actually were considered, after certainly after the Petty Harbor defense, uh, they were considered very valued fighters. They were a really good shot because of all the hunting that they'd done. Um, also, uh, they were also really used to using, like, being on the island in winter. So if you had to defend the place in the winter or anything like that, like, you know, we're... The planters were the guys, you know. Um, so that was good. That was an asset, and you know, especially like I said, you know, in in that defense against Petty Harbor, which you got you got to realize was like just a few. It was a ragtag band of like rebellious fucking planters against like four hundred French soldiers. So even though they lost, um, they weren't all slaughtered, and they actually, you know, it was like a pretty admirable uh, admirable defense. So uh, from sixteen ninety six to seventeen thirteen, the French would basically come around. Every year, and they would plunder up and down the coast. Um, they would never stay put. They wouldn't settle. They would come up. They'd raid villages. They were, they were kind of like Vikings in that way. Uh, they would just come, like, burn, pillage, uh, take everything, you know, uh, you know, whip, beat, you know, men, women, children. So, again, it's not to say that the French were, like, barbarians. The English did shit like this to their enemies. Vikings did this shit. Like, no one is good. So, again, this is just... Uh, Pardon me, uh, I don't know, it's written from an Englishman's account of the story. Did you guys know D.W. Prowse? He's the guy who wrote the book in 1895. I don't know if I mentioned it, thought I'd fill you in with that tidbit of information. Um, so anyway, the French would, they'd always go up raiding up and down the shore and uh, just picking away at the English settlements and stuff like that. And they, But they would always come back uh, to Placentia in the end, uh, sort of like birds of prey, you know? Um, needless to say, uh, during this time, the losses to the English were pretty insane in Newfoundland. Um, but mostly, I mean, outside of the coastal communities, it was really the residents of St. John's who felt it the most outside of everything being burned, pillaged, and, uh, taken, taken out and stuff, so it wasn't so much of a good time. Um, I think D.W. describes the hardships of this moment the best, uh, in page 221, where he says, In this generation, we have twice seen our fair city reduced to a heap of ashes. Some of us can remember all the horrors and miseries of that terrible night in June 1846, so D.W. would have been alive for the, the second uh, burning of St. John's. Uh, in June 1846, when thousands of poor forlorn families were huddled together without shelter, food, or clothing, the night of the fire of 46 was a terrible time of calamity, but its miseries were as nothing compared to the sufferings of the inhabitants of St. John's in the bitter winter weather of 1696. So he says he, he was actually there for the burning in 1846, and he says that couldn't have been anything compared to what it was like a few, uh, just a couple hundred years before that, which, oh God, what a good time. Um, uh, I also have here... Um, but, uh, but yeah, by the invasion and destruction of St. John's, they were not, the, the, the citizens were not only made homeless and beggars, they were banished from the land they loved so dearly. Many of them had seen their brothers, sons, husbands, and lovers who had sailed out so boldly on that frosty November morning to assist the men of Petty Harbor brought back to them, dead and mutilated by the savage allies of the French. The cr to crown all the anguish of this terrible time, they were crowded together in one small vessel, 224 men, women, and children. The horrors of that awful winter passage, no pen can describe. Well, DW, I'd say your typewriter did an okay job of that. Um, that fucking sucks. Um, so that's, that's good. Uh, so naturally... 
this ass whooping by the French caught England's attention. Um, you know, and was pretty. The England was pretty embarrassed at the time because they're still fighting Holland at this time. But they're doing a shit job over in the New World. So that was super embarrassing for the English. And uh, considering that Newfoundland was such an asset, and because they didn't have the foresight to think about coming and defending it, which is weird because you'd almost swear to God that like people had been petitioning for like a fort and some munitions and a bit of defense for the fucking colony that they hold so. De <laughs> okay, governments, yeah, they're good. Um, on page two twenty two here, I've just got they found so when. When buys came over, uh, some people were sent over to St. John's in 1697 uh, to recapture Newfoundland. Uh, they found St. John's completely abandoned. The French had burnt, pillaged, and destroyed everything movable and immovable in the once flourishing settlement. There was not a solitary building left standing. All the forts were raised to the ground. Literally, there was not one stone left upon another. They fucking raised the city and uh cool if only we'd had a couple of man of war ships which england definitely had uh over i don't know i suppose the dutch were giving them a hard time must sin right anyway um so after all this so the, the english come back with the plan of uh rebuilding newfoundland they come back and uh you know they spend the next 10 years or so rebuilding they erected what we know as Fort George and Fort William. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, and at, the, at this point, St. John's, one, once they got through it, they spent the next 10 years building it up and everything. St. John's was so well defended by the sea that you couldn't get at it. But for the fact that this guy, Deberville, remember him? The French general fellow from the last bit? Um, yeah, he. I mean, he's got the awesome idea of coming at St. John's by land, which seems to work out pretty good. Um, but... Uh, you know, uh, all this said, like, we built those forts and we built the garrisons and stuff like that. And we built, built the, this place back up and still petitioned the crown for a fucking, like, a grant or whatever, some money, some supplies to build this stuff. And they were like, no, nope, if you're going to build it, it's coming out of your pocket, all right? We're not having nothing to do with it, which, like, doesn't seem like a wise decision considering you just... Got the whole city raised because of your negligence and uh, ignorance. Okay, whatever. No big deal. Um, so, um, coming up next, D.W. gives King William a lot of credit as a great defender of England. Not to say that he was a great defender of the colony, like Newfoundland, but he was a good defender of England. And says that he took no nonsense from the French. Um, it's unfortunate, yeah, that he was he was too busy defending against Holland to have actually paid attention to Newfoundland until the disaster of 1696-1697 when the French raised the city. Um, and yeah, so just so we're clear at this point, just because the French raised the city, the French don't own all of Newfoundland right now. Uh, they own a chunk of it. Uh, they also own a chunk of the New World. Um, there's maps there. So this is 1696, 1697. You can look that map up. I don't know. Fucking, there's a search engine for that. Um, I think it's called Google. Do whatever you want. Um, but the French own a bunch of stuff, but they didn't necessarily own, um, you know, Trinity Bay, Conception Bay, uh, up to Bonavista and stuff like that. They would just fuck with them and raise it a whole bunch. Because they never stuck around. They always went back in Placentia. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so anyway, after the, all the dust had settled, King William had made what was called an act to encourage trade to Newfoundland, which the act to encourage trade to Newfoundland sounds good, but it's actually just more of the, the Devonshire West English fishermen um, bribing and corrupting the governments. They came in with new rules, blah, blah, blah. Just back to the same old fucking song and dances that they've been at before. Up to their old tricks, basically. Just kind of trying to look out for their own interests um, in the island without any regard for the actual island as a colony and its own independent place. Greed, capitalism, shit like that. Um, which never bodes well for the planters. Uh, there are some conditions in it, in this act, that basically um, it handed over... What it did was it, it handed over power... To a few like illiterate skippers in the area, so they said like, yeah, well, so they almost like gave them like a false government or whatever. They they gave over power to it actually says in the book to a few guys who can't even so much as spell their own fucking name. Only like two out of six of them or something like that could spell their own name. They gave them power, I and mean, in the in the charter or whatever, there actually wasn't any. There was stuff they said like do, don't do, but they never actually clear clarify like what any punishments would be, what any like fines, fees. 
enactments, uh, imprisonment, or whatever. They never said what any of the punishments were. So to actually punish anybody would have technically been illegal. So, like, nobody was really obeying the laws, which would have sent it into chaos. And if it sent the whole area into chaos, they were like, this is an unruly place, and we should, uh, we should pull out and go back to their old plan. So those sneaky fucking merchants or whatever, but... Uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're dickheads. Uh, so now the power was put in the hands of these local fishing admirals who were corrupt, cruel, and basically inept, you know, just whipping people, being shitheads. It says that you could literally bribe some of them with apples from New England. Like, if you had, if you had no cash, you could just bribe them with fucking apples, which is, which is a nice way to govern. I have a, on page 227 here, it says, uh, oh yeah, so we get into a new thing here. Okay, so, yeah, so, uh, bribery, cool. Um, now, on 227, it says, The most celebrated of the fishing admirals, uh, Commander-in-Chief and the Generalissimo uh, of the West Count Country Adventures in 1700 was Captain Arthur Holdsworth, Admiral of the Harbor of St. John. So, Holdsworth is a good guy. Uh, apparently, Holdsworth is a name that goes back way far into holdings, um, both in Devonshire, here in Newfoundland, stuff like that. We have Holdsworth Court. I'm sure that's where that comes from. That's called the deck, for those of you who don't know. Um, so yeah, uh, Holdsworth is an, you know, just a name in our history that's important. Um, in the last year of King William's reign, he established the English Missionary Society, um, whose goal was sort of to, uh, spread, uh, Protestantism, uh, into the New World, into their new colonies and stuff like that. And I don't really, I haven't really talked much about religion, because at this time it's just sort of like the, uh, you know, since, um, King fucking Henry, um, you know, the, the Church of England, and then the French had uh, the Catholic Church or whatever, and so that was that's sort of been it. There was no real presence of a um, a Catholic priest in the English colonies up until this time, even during this time. Um, so yeah, in the last year of William's reign, he established the English Missionary Society to spread Protestantism on the island. Um, he sent over this fellow, Reverend Jackson, shows up in 1697, started a congregation there. Apparently, he was a nice fella. Um, I don't know if it's super important. It didn't really come up again. Maybe it will. Um, I just thought that I hadn't really touched on religion. Just kind of an update. Things sort of are the way they are. English are orange, and the French are green. Or the are, uh, Catholics are green. My mother, she was... Father, he was orange. Mother, she was green. That's an old song. Look it up. Uh, then we get to the end of the chapter, which means we have an appendix. Woohoo! Bonus round. Appendix. Uh, we have the Bodan's diary. Uh, he was he was a disparaging uh, shithead. So we'll skip over all that. Who gives a crap? He was a spy. You can't really believe what he said anyway. It's just a reference. Act of King William the uh, Third, which is sort of what we were just talking about. And we move into chapter ten. Double digits, baby. Uh, which is the reign of King Anne. So the quick synopsis of important dates through this chapter. So we're gonna I'm gonna move forward a bunch of years. Then when I start talking about points, we're gonna jump back. Uh, in 1702, Captain Leake destroyed a French, uh, he oh, a bunch of French fishing stages at Trapassi, Saint Mary's, Colonnet, Saint Lawrence, and dismantled the fort at Saint Peter's. French attack on Silly Cove, and but don't tell me that there's a place called Silly Cove. Okay, I, I just had to digest that for a second. French attack on Silly Cove and Bonavista. I can only imagine what kind of wacky battle that must have been. Uh, 1705, attack on St. John's by Subercas, uh, governor of Placentia, and about 500 troops. And 1706, attack on the French fishing stations on the northern part of the island by Captains Underdown and uh, Carlton uh, and Major Lloyd. 1707, Union of England and Scotland, which is nice. Old friends getting along. I hear things are still going great. Uh, <laughs> uh, House of Commons petition to the Queen about the Newfoundland trade. 1708, we have the destruction of St. John's by St. Ovid de Bruyant. Uh, Major Lloyd at the garrison taken prisoner and sent to Placentia, Quebec, and then to France. We had an unsuccessful attack on Boy's Island by a French man of war, and then we formed a militia in St. John's. I guess we'll get to that beyond this episode. Uh, 1711, Admiral Hovenden Walker, with 15 ships, 900 guns, and 4,000 men, decided he was not able to attack Placentia. What a puss. 1712, the armistice between England and France was signed, and in 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht. Uh, the island was declared to belong of right wholly to the Great Britain. Uh, French were allowed to fish between Bonavista and Point Rich. A uh, survey of the island ordered to be made by Captain Who's a butt. 
whoever the fuck, uh, but not carried out for want of funds. 100 French settlers arrived at Louisbourg from Placentia and St. Pierre. So the French got the fuck out. Um, so during, so that, those are the, those are the big dates. Cool. Um, we nailed it. Um, a lot going on. Uh, so during the reign of Queen Anne, not too much here. Not going to keep you too long. Uh, so, uh, at the beginning, okay. So there's a passage on page 236 is during the whole of this reign, the reign of Queen Anne, um, our unfortunate colony was devastated by war. Besides minor attacks from the French privateers twice within this short period. Oh no, not Queen Anne. Sorry, before Queen Anne. This, he starts before Queen Anne starts. I'm sorry. It's uh, William, the other guy. So during the reign of King William III, um, our unfortunate colony was devastated by war besides minor attacks from French privateers twice within a short period of 12 years. St. John's and the outlying English settlements were destroyed by uh, the French. So, yeah, we, we got our asses kicked. Um, so that was, that was lovely. So at the beginning of the 1700s, while the British Army, they were enjoying victories in Europe, um, they were embarrassing themselves over here by letting their defenses down to the French, letting cities be burned in the ground. The big, like, they loved Newfoundland so much. It was so, making so much money, it was so good. And they just, like, could not seem to want to defend it. So the French were like, well, yeah, we're going to keep attacking it. So um, it was becoming embarrassing uh, to the English at that time. And so it should have. Um, then we had failings by the English. Uh, we had this guy, Graydon, uh, who I mentioned in the dates there. He came over uh, with a fleet from England to destroy Placentia, all them guns, for like 4,000 men, whole pile of guns, bunch of ships, got there, and then he bailed, saying he, he wouldn't be able to take it. Better to, better to go back. It was, it was too well defended. Um, and apparently they could have actually taken it, which is embarrassing. Um, on page 237, it says here, Admiral uh, Hoven and Walker's great... Ex Expedition to capture Quebec and Placentia in 1711. Wait, that's not... Uh, I may have made a mix-up here. Uh, Graydon... So Graydon came over the fleet and bailed. Uh, yeah, and then this guy comes over. This was still a more ludicrous failure. This nautical Falstaff, Falstaff from Shakespeare, uh, complained bitterly that frivolous pamphleteers had laughed him to scorn as an idiot and a coward. He was terribly indignant because he had held him... Uh, to the ridicule for not having taken Placentia. So, like, apparently Placentia was actually, it looked well defended, but it fucking wasn't at all. The guys could have actually went in there, no sweat, and fucking taken the place. And then afterwards, when they didn't, when they all bitched out, the, you know, the English got made fun of um, for being like, guys, like, what the fuck? Like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you do that? It seemed like a sure thing, and it was. Um, so they should have done it. Um, on the bottom of page 37 here, I have, uh, and while they might scout and ridicule a British admiral with 15 ships of war, 900 guns, and a land force of 4,000 men, actually declaring that it was not practical to make an attempt on Placentia, whilst they knew from an intercepted dispatch of someone's so-and-so, the fucking French governor, uh, that this little garrison was in want of supplies of all kinds, that the promised reinforcement of two companies of soldiers had not arrived, and that the La Valère, their only armed ship in the station, had been fucking lost. So, like, apparently they, they also knew this. Like, they, sh they should have just, that would have been it. Said and done, but no, they went out. DW even goes on to explain it. I, I don't really quite get his graph here. But he's like, this page here is just like, here's how they easily could have done it. Like... 300 years later, he's like, man, guys, fucking have a look at the shit. I mean, come on. Uh, for uh, 200 years later, I should say. Um, so that's on the bottom of page 237. And then uh, then the, the last couple pages we sort of, uh, you know, we sort of started to talk about between 16, 